You're listening to Combat Radio with Ethan Dettenmeyer, right here on L.A. Talk Radio. All right, we're back. Uh, joining us now, actually, is somebody we respect quite a bit around the Combat Radio studios. He's a bit of a genius, writer, director, extraordinaire, if you will. Um, he is the man responsible for the lost skeleton of Cadavra. The lost skeleton returns again. How about uh, a dark and stormy night? Many, many classics that are epic in every sense of the word. And he's actually joining us from a location right now. So we've got him a little bit on a Skype, uh, but we hope to have him in studio soon. Uh, director extraordinaire and our good friend, Larry Blamer. How are you, Larry? Hey, guys. Hey, man. Welcome good. to the How show. Are you? Good. I'm sorry for the rough connection at first. You know, it's a, I know it's tough to get some of you high rollers at times. Yeah, uh, that's right. I yeah. know. But thank you. <laughs> Uh, thank you for the having of me. It's good to be had. Yeah, thank you. No, I got to say, this is a real privilege for us because your work is uh, top tier, my friend. It's some of the most epic entertainment anyone can hope to, uh, <laughs> you know, be in a theater with. And, you know, it's interesting in talking to you, I was actually even more impressed because you were so modest about it, your skill set and what brought, uh, you know, your uh, battery of films to life. I mean, I'd like you, if you could, I mean... Take me through the process. First of all, I want to point out you're in studio with my co-host Tom Vitorino, Hello. manager extraordinaire. You're Hi, all, Tom. You, you got Stephen Appel who handles sports for us, and Rick Moore of Twilight's what, in studio what, with what? us. What? Stephen, uh, Rick, hello. But um, you know, I want to say real quick, uh, what I'd like I'd like to hear it from you rather than me tell the story. What is it that got you going on something like Lost Skeleton of Cadavra? I mean, what is it that? How does? What's the genesis? I mean, not the idea genesis, but what are the real logistical circumstances that said, I'm going to make a, a movie? Walk us through that, if you could. Yeah, circumstances <laughs> Circumstances is a good word for it, because it was, and, and, and our fans have heard this forever, but, you know, we, my wife and I uh, uh, had, had moved to L.A. with an internet company, and the right after we got there, there was the, the dot-com crash, and, and, and suddenly our investors pulled out, and so we were kind of, you know, up there without a net. Um, trying to raise money for uh, uh, for several months, and nobody was kicking in anything to uh, internet entertainment because they didn't know how to make money off it um, at that time. And 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 out of frustration, partly, uh, and a little bit of desperation, I said, "Well, hell, I'm going to make. Why don't I make a movie? Could I make a movie?" And 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 I had just read about digital video. I don't know if you guys have heard of this. This is awesome stuff, digital video, it's cutting edge, it's brand new, and um, I, uh, I I called a producer, a friend of mine, I said, could we make a movie for $40,000, and he nearly drove off the road, and then said, yeah, I think we can, and so I, I, I you know, I had this, um, all these B-movies stored up in my head, I've loved them since I was a kid, and it kind of spewed out in a five-day assault of words that became the lost skeleton cadaver. I know, I know when you see the movie, it looks like I spent five years on it, but really it was five days. Um, and, uh, we shot it. Uh, we, we, you know, we, we prepped it of course. And, and, uh, we, we shot it in, um, 10 and a half days. I should mention Lars Perkins was an awesome guy that, that, uh, that footed the bill for it, which ended up being like 60,000, I think. Um, and we shot it in ten and a half days, and uh, um, of craziness, and and uh, and you know, and the rest is history. Well, I got to tell you, you know, there's a certain art to what you do that I don't know if the casual observer can grasp it. But it's a uh, you rise to a very, very significant challenge with these films. Number one, I mean, I remember watching it, going, "This is unreal." The way this guy has captured the look, feel, and even sort of the, I guess, struggled acting styles of that time of like the 40s 50s the ed wood era and then i remember i i was telling you larry i fell asleep and i woke up because my kid was laughing so loud at that scene where the <laughs> skeleton is leading him through the wilderness and i that's when i watched it and i realized you know what this is a classic this movie really i mean and and and, and you know the fact that it's filmed in skeletorama you know, those those little touches you put to it that are just, you know, and I, my, I guess, did you, when you said, let me do a movie, and what I love about it is when we were talking, you said, hey, you just got to go out and shoot it. You know, you got to, everyone's got a camera, just do them, don't talk about it, just yeah, do it. Yeah, you know, I, 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 that, that's the advice I usually give if I'm asked 
advice. Uh, uh, I, I also, you know, don't don't talk about doing it. Just go do it. You know, everyone's got a camera these days, and and uh, and you can do it. And and that's what we did. But um, by the way, Skeletorama is still not a fully understood process. <laughs> yeah, it's can you can you walk us through the process of Skeletorama? <laughs> uh... <laughs> not really. It's it's too um, arcane and uh, and scientific. I can't really. And plus, there's things I don't want to divulge about it. It's just very secret and dangerous. Yes, very, oh. very, very not not just secret, but secret and dangerous. dangerous. And I love that you you know the skeleton is credited as the skeleton, <laughs> you know. And here's the yeah, thing: yeah. I, I just recently had the privilege of embracing the Lost Skeleton Returns again, the sequel. And I understand there's a third in the works, which I cannot wait for. If our audience is listening to this interview, and they will hear it, I'm sure. This is something you have to get behind. You have to hound this man to deliver Lost Skeleton 3. You have to torture him. You have to make his life hell until he gets yeah. us Lost Skeleton yeah. 3. But, I mean, that one, the skull flies. And that was some of the most hilarious stuff. I mean, the, you know, it's coming yeah, from like, Warner Brothers. You know, we have a production entertainment background. So I think we look at films a little differently. And I was thinking things like, you know, who designs these monsters for him? And to make sure that the zipper in the back of the suit is visible. You know, it's like. Who does he find? Who does this director find to execute all this? Because it's all really, it's all genius. And in the sequel, there's a moment where you go from black and white to when they enter a new land and it shifts to color. And I'm thinking, you know, this guy is firing on all cylinders creatively. Really, really impressive. And, it, you know. That's, that idea was from Mike Schlesinger. You know, Mike, uh, uh, Mike was the Sony executive that picked up the movie. And it came out in 2004, and he uh, then came on board. Uh, he was having, I think, more, more fun with working with us than he was at Sony. I know that's hard to believe, but um, he, uh, Mike, is an interesting guy because he's uh, he, he was he was the late Roger Ebert's favorite suit. I think he, right. he, he, he called him his favorite suit, and the reason is. How many studio executives do you know of? At a, you know, at a, at a big studio that, that love that actually love movies and know about movies and actors and directors and writers and all the people that made the movies. Well, um, so he's a rare individual, and he uh, he, he came on board. He, so he, he he came up with um, uh, the the uh, the transition to uh, <coughs> excuse me to color idea and. Um, uh, and, and you know, you mentioned the zippers and the suits and stuff. And you, you, part of the key, the key is surrounding yourself with people who, first of all, they're, you're fortunate enough that they're your friends, so you you get along, you have a good time with what you're doing. But then they're really talented on on, on top of that. My old buddy Courtney Skinner, who's a terrific illustrator, he um, uh, created the mutant for the first film and. And, um, you know, it's that kind of effort, like, let's put on a show. It's really uh, um, just kind of low-tech, hey. everybody pitching in. We've got a cast that is is now like a, you know, a family. I mean, we've, we've done a number of movies together now, and it's been it's been really cool. Hey, Larry, it's Tom Vitorino. You mentioned illust illustrators uh, in your last sentence, a friend of yours who was illustrating. Um, you went to uh, the Art Institute of Boston, right? I did. And and whenever you were there, you were basically doing a lot of graphic illustration. You were, is that you, you were studying under well, who was that? Uh, uh, Howard Bear or Norman Bear? Norman Bear. Yeah. So let me ask you something. Does that attention de to detail and does that really help you in the idea of de detail in filmmaking? Did you find that that because there's a lot of concentration that comes with illustration? Did you find that was actually a, a big help that background? Yeah, I, I think so. You know, one of the biggest helps there is, is, is doing storyboards. And even with the first film, La Scale and the Cadavra, I storyboarded the whole film because I, I wanted to be, you know, it was my first movie and I wanted to make sure I was as prepared as possible and that and that we had a tool to use on set. And, and I still storyboard. And, and that's that's a great thing right there. And then the other the other aspect is is you're able to um, to communicate visually because of that. Uh, and, 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 and get across ideas when you're in pre-production that, um, you know, you might not be able to do otherwise. So it's, it's very handy being, you know, being an illustrator, you know, um, which is a big part of my Steam Wars project. And we can talk about that whenever you guys. Yeah, no, I want to I want to get to Steam Wars in a second, but uh, I let not yeah. losing sight of the classics, Larry, if you will. Uh, you know, you're lucky. You are very indeed fortunate that you had an executive over Sony who got what you were trying to do and didn't try to undo it and kind of turn it into today's slosh, basically, who understood 
what yeah. you were trying. And let me break the fourth wall on this, so to speak. People who think that it's difficult to play an actor who's really struggling with bad dialogue, I mean, that sounds like it's it's a compliment to you. I know it doesn't sound like one, but when you you know you're doing a film and you're trying to give people you know very obvious dialogue, if you that's hard, that's that's that acting is actually very difficult, I think, for a lot of performers. It is very difficult. But what did you mean by uh, bad dialogue? Well, I'm you know, you confused. got things like you got things where like they're talking and they're like, yes, I went into the woods. Yesterday, the woods yeah, are yeah. dangerous. It, 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 you know, part of it, was, you know, I was I was inspired a lot by Ed Wood, obviously, yeah. and but but also by other um, uh, low budget filmmakers, by a certain aspect of the 1950s um, sci fi horror movies in particular that is this childlike innocence that they have. Yeah, exactly. And it's in the words. It's in the words, and and so there's a certain sometimes a certain rep repetition that doesn't need to be there there's exposition that doesn't need to be there and um and it becomes its own kind of language which is kind of which is kind of fun and we have fun with that our fans have fun with that because yeah. they, they they you know on 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 facebook and such they talk back to us in this in the same kind of language all the time and it's amazing how many people quote lines from from this movie it's uh, been really uh really I, fun i am not surprised i would love to sit next to you at a convention sometime just to hear the fans i mean a bad dialogue is the wrong way to put it but the scene that's coming to mind is in lost skeleton 2 there's a not the woman answers the door and then cut to the you know the secret agent and the woman sitting on the couch and the man goes Thank you for inviting me in a few moments ago, Mrs. Uh, you yeah, know, it's yeah. like, you know, kind of like that. You know, how did we get to the couch? Explain that you've been invited in. You know, it's like my personal favorite line I think comes from Dark and Stormy Night, where the woman in the library is about to get choked to death, and the killer's approaching her, and yeah. she goes, "If you're one of the servants, you can forget about a recommendation letter." <laughs> you know, it's <laughs> you know, just one of those classic kind of that. You know, you know, that really took like a seemed like an evolution towards where people were delivering lines in such a sharp, witty way. I mean, there's one moment, and I want you to explain it to me, where a guy says, you know, we had a lot of fun together, something to the effect, I'm paraphrasing this, we play checkers, you know, study ancient Sumerian meat rituals. You know, you know and I'm like, ancient <laughs> Sumerian meat rituals? I'm going to have to ask Larry to explain that one on the air. What is an ancient Sumerian meat ritual? Well, where is it's, it's something that you find at Forgetful Milkman's Quadrangle. Uh, <laughs> you know, <laughs> even in Lost Skeleton, even in the first movie, uh, there was an attempt there to sort of push the the boundaries of the absurd. Not just not just to make a something that looked and sounded like a um, a bargain basement fifties movie, but to 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 take it to sort of some some kind of silly heights. I, I feel that where our movies, our comedies today, are are a little bit lacking in 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 silliness, and I you know I we like to try to bring some of that. That back, you know, um, absurdity is something that uh, it's my favorite kind of humor. I think the absurd, and and I don't think we we see enough of it. So so in the guise of these movies that look, you know, these old movies, we try to go a little crazy, a little mental with yeah. stuff like that. You're listening to Combat Radio with Ethan Dettenmeyer. Right here on L.A. Talk Radio. 